Uh, we'll move on to the next talk. Uh, I'll invite uh, uh, Dr. Jayanta Rai, uh, who is the Director of Stroke Program and a Senior Consultant at the Institute of Neurosciences, Kolkata. Uh, he'll be uh, giving his talk on choosing right anticoagulation, some practical tips. Go to Dr. Jayanta Rai. Uh, uh, thank you, uh, my chairpersons. Let me just try to uh, share my slide. Is it visible now? Yeah. Yes, Jayanta, it's visible. Just put it on the That's fine. Yeah. Thank you so much. So good afternoon to everyone. My special thanks to Professor Padma and Professor Rohit. My Both of them are my good friends for organizing such a fantastic program for the residents and also for us to revise the entire stroke. And thanks to my chairpersons as well. So my uh, topic here, as you see, is the, uh, the right anticoagulation in stroke prevention. So the flow of my talk will go like this. I will mainly focus on the secondary stroke prevention, of course, but I will touch upon some other things which are relevant very briefly. That is the primary prevention, the initiation of the anticoagulation part at its timing, which is again a little bit controversial issue. I will discuss that. The choice of the agent, the switching between agents when it's required, and surgical management and few more special uh, areas. So I will be uh, <coughs> um, borrowing uh, information from these three important guidelines, the European one, the Canadian last year, and very recently published the AHA guideline on secondary stroke prevention, in addition to some relevant publications, papers uh, related to this subject. So anticoagulation in stroke prevention, the indications are mainly for cardioembolic stroke, secondary prevention, but non-valvular atrial fibrillation, primary prevention is also done with anticoagulation sometimes. Some cases of arterial dissections where we do use oral and I mean anticoagulations, I will come to that later on. Some cases of hypercoagulable conditions with stroke and special situations. Well, let me start with a case. This is an 80-year-old lady, diabetic, hypertensive, with atrial fibrillation, but was only on clopidogrel, the reason best known to her cardiologist only. Came with a left hemiplegia, reached hospital within one hour of the onset. She had atrial fibrillation on the monitor with permissible blood glucose and blood pressure. NIH was 22. So the baseline CT scan was a good scan. And we did a CT immediately, which showed there is an M1 occlusion. So obviously, everything, the stage was set. So bolus was given within 30 minutes of arrival, followed by infusion, and we immediately moved her to the lab for mechanical thrombectomy. And the groin puncture was done within 60 minutes of arrival. So the diagnostic shot showed the vessel was open by the IV only. So we didn't have to do anything much about that. So we... Uh, did not proceed with the mechanical and she started improving right away. and by next morning NIH was 4 we CT was uh, CT showed no bleed so the MR showed we could save a lot of brain there is a uh, small area of damage in the basal ganglia and little bit in the cortex so outcome was uh, good patient was improving she was discharged on day 6 with oral anticoagulation chat first was 5 so, till the, <clears throat> this far, this was a kind of a copybook situation. We love that. Now, the question starts from here. Which oral anticoagulation agent should be prescribed? And when we should initiate that? In our case, we did it, for, did it on the sixth day. We'll come back to that discussion again. Question is, can we start earlier in this case or in other cases? Aren't we running a risk of Father stroke by delaying oral anticoagulation initiation. And what are the basic lab parameters we need to choose, uh, to need to do to choose the right agent and the right dose? Now, coming back to the guideline, if you look at the Canadian best practice guideline and also the other guidelines, non valvular atrial fibrillation in stroke TIA, oral anticoagulation is indicated. 
and it's indicated over aspirin clear but not dual uh, and not dual antiplatelet therapy and these days newer anticoagulants or doax are preferred over vka so this far this is very clear this is practice and this is a standard of care now coming back to another question if mrs b were already on warfarin what we would do we we'll continue with warfarin or we switch over to a doac now if a patient mrs b or any other patient with the inr well maintained between 2 to 3 inr and the time into the therapeutic range is more than 70% and without any adverse effects then probably warfarin should be continued rather than switching over to the doac but the patient preferences are they also there and in those cases we might prefer to switch over to a doac agent now that right time of initiating oral anticoagulations the much debatable issue we all are aware of this 1362 formula i'm not going to the detail of that that is the european uh, guideline which is not based on any evidence but mostly the expert opinion tia j1 minor stroke day 3 moderate stroke day 6 big stroke day 12 something like that but those have to be a bland infant not a hemorrhagic infant. if this is a hemorrhagic infant then we have to delay the initiation this is the standard practice and we all tend to do that but this is not so simple look at the major two act trials aristotle for epixaban they excluded the patients the stroke patients in the last seven days who had a stroke rely excluded stroke patients in the last 14 days or severe stroke patients for 3 months which is the same for rocket af for rivaroxaban so practically these doac trials excluded those stroke patients who we are actually trying to or justifying our early anti coagulation so the data from this major three trials cannot directly be extrapolated to this uh, kind of populations what we are talking about now question is if we are delaying the anticoagulation from an index to what is the risk first of all we don't want to delay that there is an if there is an another embolic event till the patient is started on oral anticoagulations on the other hand if we want to rush up and start early anticoagulation then we also have a fear of bleed so now we are between devil and deep sea so how justified is the fear that is a fear of bleed fear of further embolism it has been seen that about 20 40% of all stroke patients with i mean ischemic stroke patient had some hemorrhagic transformation at some point of time and if it is a tardy embolic stroke then it is almost 70% on the other way 95% of hemorrhagic infarcts are caused by cardiomolism and cardiomolic stroke if there is a recurrent embolism after an index ischemic stroke there is increase in mortality up to 70% versus 24% if there is no recurrent embolism so recurrent embolism is bad but what is the risk of recurrent embolism in case of a cardiomolic stroke with a fib it is also seen that in most of the studies it's around 5 to 8% in the first two weeks and even if we start them on oral aspirin then also the risk remains around 5% so the risk of 5 to 8% of further ischemic stroke in the first two weeks as opposed to the risk of bleed after starting an early oral anticoagulation so this is where we are and we have to give a judgement let us look at some more data this is almost a 30 years old uh, publication from stroke this, this this is of course the vka era not the noac era they treated the patient with acute anticoagulation 
and they found that 2% had brain hemorrhage and 2% had artery recurrent embolizations. So these data suggested that acute anticoagulation may be employed safely in most patients with cardioembolic stroke, but that such treatment does not clearly benefit this population as a whole. So definitely a group of population, group of patients with cardioembolic stroke may be benefited or may be safe with early anticoagulations, but we do not know who are they. And again, another paper almost around the same time, 1993, they also looked at uh, 200 patients with 40% of cardioembolic strokes. And this was an MRI-based study. They found 68% patients had <coughs> hemorrhagic conversions, but none of that had major clinical deterioration. So it's not that every hemorrhagic transformation is risky and bad. So if you look at the RAP study, which is a prospective study of uh, almost 1,000 patients, and almost 90% of them actually got PKA. And this study showed 76, 7.6% had ischemic stroke and 3.4% asymptomatic bleed. So risk of stroke is more than the bleed. And they also found that 4 to 14 days period is probably the best time window to initiate anticoagulations, to lower the primary events, because earlier than that and later than that, maybe a little risky or maybe late. Now, coming to the NOAC era, all we are talking about so far is mostly on the VKA usage. After the NOAC, the things have definitely changed. We also know, we also experienced, but we do not have robust data to recommend NOAC in early on after an cardioembolic stroke. I, there are some studies recently published. I just quoted a couple one from the German urology, where they used Rivaraxaban within the first five days. But they were mild to moderate stroke, and there was no symptomatic bleed. So they found this is safe. Another neurology paper, which also looked at TUAC, mostly in, in almost 200 patients, and median delay of five days from the index event, there was no bleed in the NOAC group but seven recurrent stroke and one ICH in the VKA. So again, NOAC fared better compared to VKA if we start anticoagulations a little early. So based on these available informations, the point I'm, I'm trying to make here is the initiation of early anticoagulation, that is less than seven days, is probably safe in any type of cardioembolic stroke, provided this is a planned stroke. And NOACs are preferred over VKA. And they may be started even 48 hours after the onset. Hemorrhagic changes, what we see in the MRI, are probably overestimates. Until we see a CT correlate, which is also showing a bleed, probably we overestimate them and they are not as harmful as we presume. Lastly, HI1 kind of bleed in CT or MR in a patient who has, again, a very high risk of further embolism, probably safe to start oral anticoagulations where benefit outweighs the risk. So the current recommendations of oral anticoagulations are too conservative, in my opinion, not based on good evidence and should be rewritten in the post moac era. Now, another question, does Mrs. B need any antithrombotic bridging before oral anticoagulation, if you recall the case we discussed. First of all, yes, but only bridging with aspirin. So till we start our oral anticoagulation on the, uh, I mean, the decided date, she can be given aspirin, but not heparin. And patients who are at high risk of bleeding, where <clears throat> we are not giving oral anticoagulations or avoiding oral anticoagulations, Again, dual antiplatelets are of no good because they do not prevent a recurrent embolism, but the bleed risk is as good as oral anticoagulations. So dual antiplatelets are not substitute of oral anticoagulations if we are fear of bleed. But patients who are unable to take oral anticoagulations for any reason, for allergy or whatever the reason, you can use aspirin alone. But in this group of patients now these days can opt for 
lift atrial appendages closer. And of course, for mechanical valve, it's PKA only. No acts are not yet recommended. Now, what if a patient who got atrial fibrillation and who are already on uh, oral anticoagulations, any form, had another stroke, despite on anticoagulations? First of all, identify and address the medication or adjuvants. This is very important, especially in DOACs, because missing a single dose of DOAC, especially once daily dosing DOACs like edoxaban or rivaroxaban, patient may be under anticoagulant. Second is for warfarin, INR control is important. Even in case of DOAC, drug-drug interaction should be checked. Go back to your initial diagnosis of stroke mechanism and see whether that was correct or patient has got a dual mechanism, especially large patient disease, where your anticoagulation is probably not giving the enough protection. And of course, the standard uh, vascular risk factor modifications. So in those cases, should we switch over from one to other? If the patient is on a DOAC, is it justified to switch over to a second DOAC or stay on the same DOAC or something, some other uh, agent like VKA? First of all, there is no recommendations that switching from one to other in this situation helps. You can do that. You cannot do that. But remember that adding aspirin on your existing uh, anticoagulation does not help. So do not do that. Now, every uh, uh, decision is not straightforward or well documented or well guided. Let me discuss Kunandra. This is about Mrs. C, 84 years female, who came with a left MC infarct in January 2021. And she had a history of head injury long back. 20, year 2000, and she came with a persistent atrial fibrillation. This is the CT. So this is the old glasses from the fall. And there is a stroke here, which we may not be uh, clearly seeing in the CT, but you can probably see here. And <clears throat> there is a small hypertension here. So look at the MR. So this is the recent stroke the embolic stroke one and this is the GRE which has been reported as a right frontal cavernoma with recent bleach. And this is the flare. So now the question is should we anticoagulate her? Her chart first is pretty high, it's six with 18% annualized risk of stroke. So definitely the risk of stroke is very high and we are scared about the bleach from the cavernoma. So <clears throat> definitely we hate these kind of situations, but we sometimes face these kind of patients as well. So I looked at the literature, not much we find, but this is one, uh, a little bit older paper, which is an observational study of cavernous, cavernous malformations. And it shows that long-term antithrombotic treatment by antiplatelet or warfarin does not increase the frequency of cavernoma related hemorrhage. Patients harboring single or multiple CCM suffering ischemic stroke or heart uh, sorry, or heart disease should not be withheld antithrombotic therapy. So the risk is probably not as high as we anticipate. And this is a recent Lancet neurology paper, which is a population with cohort study, systematic review, and meta analysis. They also uh, Came, came with the same kind of opinion that antithrombotic therapy use is associated with lower risk of bleed or focal neurological deficit from cerebral cavernous malformations than avoidance of antithrombotic therapy. So if you recall our patient who had a chat mask of six and this paper uh, assures us that the risk is probably less. So those kind of patients should be anticoagulated. Of course, after discussion with the risk and benefit with the family. This is another point and from. We also do see this kind of patients in our practice that is cerebral amyloid angiopathy or microbleed due to other situations. Now, of course, we know that from our experience, all microbleeds are not as risky as others. Some are low risk 
for bleed, some are very high risk of bleed. For example, this patient, the, the, the picture on your left side, the first one, which who has got a multiple microbleeds, mostly cortical and some superficial sclerosis due to my amyloid angiopathy, is very high risk of bleed. So I am not going to anticoagulate this patient and probably uh, you also have the same kind of opinion. And this patient, if it is high risk, we definitely recommend left atrial appendices closer. This patient in the middle who has got multiple cavernomas, but depending on the risk and benefit, we can decide. But this patient who has got a, a, a couple of uh, small microbleeds due to probably hypertensive disease, probably at lower risk, and we can decide about uh, anticoagulating this patient. So this uh, review, which uh, in the Journal of Stroke, they suggest that clinical approach based on the absolute risk of ischemic stroke versus intracerebral hemorrhage and considering the specific clinical context, as I already shown in the picture, might be helpful in guiding anticoagulation decisions in the setting of CAA and atrial fibrillation. So definitely it's a case-to-case -case based analysis and decision making. Now coming to arterial dissection and anticoagulations, my friend uh, Dr. Arvind Sarma has already spoke on that in detail, but I just like to mention couple of points relevant to my topic, that the controversy still exists. The CADIS trial in German neurology, it's randomized patients with antiplatelet and anticoagulations. And at the end of three months, the primary events were really low. And there was no difference between the two arms of antiplatelet and anticoagulations. But a recently concluded and uh, published this treat CAD trial in Lancet neurology which is basically a non-inferiority trial of aspirin over VKA, could not show non-inferiority of aspirin. So what does it mean? That the primary endpoint occurred more in the aspirin group, that is 23%, compared to the VKA group. And seven patients in the aspirin group and none in the vitamin K antagonist group had ischemic stroke. So basically, the patients who are on aspirin showed more primary events like ischemic stroke. So again, we are coming back to the uh, I mean, uh, situation that we know aspirin works, we know anticoagulation works, we know aspirin doesn't work in all the cases of uh, dissection, but we do not know which patient will be benefited. So... This is exactly the conundrum lies, and we face this kind of situation in our practice. And almost similar kind of uh, uh, case we reported uh, years back from uh, sorry, years back in uh, Journal of Neuroimaging, where we reported a case: a patient presented with a dissection, having uh, recurrent embolic events despite an anticoagulations, which we detected by doing emboli monitoring. And we added anticoagulation to this patient and the all emboli stopped and there was no, no more events. So <clears throat> I think my friend, uh, Dr. Vijay Kumar can comment on that uh, later on. But yes, there are some patients who dissection who are on antiplatelets may not be benefited only with antiplatelets. We need some more, uh, some more information to decide like TCD monitoring or something like that to decide whether we need to put them on anticoagulations for a beta stroke prevention. Now the hypercoagulating states. Much have been talked sorry. about this. Later I will uh, just... Uh, okay, I, I, I will just conclude in two slides. So hypercoagulable states, and uh, this 2021 guideline is pretty clear about it, that VKA only for antiphospholipid syndromes not for only antiphospholipid positive antibodies, but in the rest of the cases, we do not have any evidence to go for uh, long-term anticoagulation, it is antiplatelets. So in this last slide, I like to say that embolic stroke with low ejection fractions, if they have a sitting thrombus in LA or LD, then three month warfarin is probably enough. If they have a left ventricular assist device, then aspirin plus warfarin, if they have a LD non-compaction, then it is warfarin 
and other cases, individualized cases, you decide. But other than NVAF associated with low ejection fractions, we do not put them on long term oral anticoagulations. So I leave here and just uh, one, the last slide that the choice of anticoagulation sometimes depends on patient preference and patient's clinical conditions. Like Asian patients with high risk of ICH, probably Epixaban is a little bit preferable. In elderly patients with high risk of, again, bleed, Epixaban, in renal impairment, Epixaban has got a little bit more advantage. Patients with GI bleed, again, Epixaban. Patient has bleed uh, more than three, Epixaban. Patients with recurrent stroke on VKA, Devigatran, and patients have a, has a uh, compliance issue once daily dose is required, then probably rivaroxaban. So these are the different, uh, I mean, uh, issues which we can decide, which we can consider while choosing anticoagulations. They are all good, but there are some differences in their uh, practical usage. So I stop here and thank you very much for your time. Uh, uh, thank you, Dr. Jayantha Rai. Uh, uh, I don't see any uh, questions uh, in the Q&A box. I think uh, Dr. Shubhnam Sani, uh, uh, we have time for one question. You can ask your question, please. Yeah. Uh, good afternoon, sir. So yes. that was a really informative seminar. Uh, so this is Dr. Shubham. I'm a medicine resident. Yes, sir, sir, I had a real-life patient-related doubt. So uh, I had this middle-aged man with no classical vascular risk factors. Uh, uh, he, have, he was a case of moderate COVID-19 pneumonia and he developed a large vessel occlusion and he had a uh, M1 occlusion and uh, uh, he had uh, developed stroke because of that. Uh, incidentally, complete um, the vascular imaging of the entire body revealed that there were multiple thrombosis in the femoral veins as well, in the descending aorta as well as the left renal vein. Extensive cardiac workup, thrombophilia workup, echocardiography, everything was normal. Now in such a case, sir... Uh, since like we claimed it as a covid related coagulopathy related stroke and thrombosis so what would you prefer a antiplatelet versus anticoagulant and b if anticoagulant which anticoagulant to prefer well subham this is a very practical question when we probably do not know the right answer at this moment so because this uh, thromboembolic conditions post covid brain or in other areas where we tend to anticoagulate them for a longer time and we have been extensively using uh, NOACs in these situations, of course, without any uh, proper usage or um, proper data, because we don't have any time to create data. But I would say in this particular case, you should anticoagulate the patient uh, at least for three months and re-evaluate the patients, not only, not only based on the vascular imaging, but also definitely on the, on the parameter of your uh, coagulation parameters like uh, D-dimer, etc. Because since the patient does not have any recurrent cause of embolism from heart or anywhere else, so beyond three months, if all parameters normalizes, including your vessels, there is no point continue with anticoagulations. I am comfortable with DOAX in this kind of situations, easy to handle, but if you want to use VKA with close monitoring, you can still do that. But I, I can... Uh, Ask opinion from others. Uh, I think I'll just comment. Uh, no, uh, the most important thing is the primary disease, you know, and uh, its effects. So we need to closely monitor these patients. Uh, definitely, long-term anticoagulation is needed, and uh, the best thing is uh, to have uh, new oral anticoagulations. So, Doctor uh, Devashish Chandri, you have any final comments? We can uh, wind up because uh, yeah, I think we can wind up. We're already past the allotted time. So yeah. I, I don't have any other questions. So thank you. I thank the Department of Neurology, uh, Orin Institute, Professor Padma, Professor yeah. Rohit, and other members of the team uh, for the kind invitation. And also we had a fantastic session. And I think the residents for which the primarily it is focused, uh, they have benefited out of this. Yeah. Thank you. And thank also you. my co-chair, uh, Dr. Jai Raj Pandey. Thank you. Thank, you. Thank, thank you. you so much. Thank, thank you, the chairpersons and all the speakers. Fantastic talks. 